and I'm so excited today. This is literally the treat for my whole week is I am going to be in conversation with Erin Entrada Kelly, who is one of my heroes in middle grade and just like, oh my God, I love her so much. Amazing, And I can't believe she's going to be right here on this show today. You guys are in for such a treat. Erin, are you there? I'm here. Oh my God. Hi. Congratulations on your new book. Thank I am you. So, you so excited to read it. I have the, um, I have the PDF, or sorry, the galley, and I have the, um, which is not an illegal PDF, by the way. I got it from Jackie. So <laughs> whenever people say that, I'm just like, oh no. Um, but I have, I've been reading the excerpt and I love it so much. You have such a way of capturing all of the, all of the innocence and all of the magic of being a middle grade kid. And so my first question to you, Erin, is what was your childhood like? Hmm, what was it like? Well, I think anyone who's read my books or will read my books, this won't be surprising. I was very um, sensitive, lonely. Um, didn't feel like I quite fit in anywhere. Um, had very low self-esteem, low self-confidence, just d didn't really, you know, it was just trying to figure myself out. Right. And kind of felt unmoored. So I think, you know, that feeling of loneliness is definitely something that's common in all my books because it definitely informed my adolescence. Yeah, and I could totally relate to that. You know, we moved around so much as, as a kid that I was always lonely and I didn't, you know, and that's why we turned to books, you know, because it was sort of like the only constant in my life. Um, yeah. Now you've written a wide variety. First of all, you are so prolific. I mean, I have to say it's amazing. Thank and I want to ask you, like, how do you do it? And also, what about right now in this time? Are you finding this time of, you know, sheltering in place to be more inspiring for you? Because you have, I don't know, do you have more time or is it harder for you? I feel like uh, I definitely have more time because I don't have, first of all, I don't have, my daughter's grown and out of the house, so I don't have little ones to worry about. Um, You're so lucky. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. I mean, I have a, I have a kid, but he's 50, so. <laughs> um, but I don't have to worry about getting, you know, kids to Zoom and all this other kind of stuff. So, and my tour was canceled, of course. And so the travel is done. So I actually have more time. I think my biggest issue is I kind of have this uh, feeling of, oh, my God, I, now I have all this time. So I really need to be doing something, but I can't decide what I want to focus on. So then I wind up, you know, doing nothing. <laughs> I have um, the same, I have the same problem. Right? I, I, you know, it's hard. Okay. And it's it's focus, also really yeah. hard when you're juggling multiple projects. And I know you're such a prolific writer. So I want to ask you about that process. Like, do you work on one thing at a time? Or are you juggling multiple things? So usually I work on one thing at a, at a time. But because historically, I've been doing, you know, I've been released a middle grade novel a year and I'm always working of course on the next thing when the book comes out you know so usually I'm focused on one thing which is good and I think one reason why I'm having more trouble focusing now is because I'm doing a chapter book so I'm launching a chapter book <gasps> series and I'm, oh my God, I'm it. so excited yes I'm very excited so uh, I'm writing it and illustrating it and it comes You're out illustrating next year. It too? I am Oh, wow. I did not know that. You could, that, is, that is like a superpower. I always tell people, you know, if someone can write and they can draw, it's just, I mean, my mind is like blown right now with <laughs> well, the amount of talent. We'll see. I, I, I do an okay job drawing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I've been doing that and that is a, a much different process. I mean, it's the same in a lot of ways, but it's different. And so I'm doing that. But I also um, have a new middle grade project, a new middle grade novel that I have in my head that I'm writing. So usually I work on one thing at a time, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm learning to try. Maybe that's part of my problem is juggling. Are you finding, are you finding the chapter book to be harder to write or easier? Because, you know, for, it's so hard for me to simplify things. Like <laughs> Yes, I think that the fewer words required the much more difficult it is so 
uh, I find of all the, you know, in the landscape of children's literature, I would say picture books are the hardest. Right. And for me, and then afterward, after that would, would be chapter books. So it is, it is a lot harder for a lot of different reasons. I feel like middle grade is where I'm most comfortable and it's like a, by very natural writing voice. Mm -hmm. And the chapter book, the chapter book is more challenging mostly because like that sad, lonely, introverted kid um, trying to interject that in a chapter book in a way that still is interesting and things are happening. Right. And, you know, because when you're seven or eight years old, you don't have the same level of awareness as a middle schooler. So right. it, it's been very rewarding, but challenging. But which is good because we should always challenge ourselves to. Yeah. You know, is that why it. is that why you wanted to do it? Did you want to like because you've been branching out? I mean, even in middle grade, you've been branching out into fantasy into, you know, so is that why you wanted to do the chapter book? I think it started with my editor actually is the one who put the kind of like the seed of thought in my brain because she said, you know, I think you would do really well writing chapter books. You have a good voice for chapter books. And I had never thought of it before really but then once once that seed is planted you know of course I'm thinking about it I'm like maybe <laughs> um and it's taken you know we've done a lot of revisions we're finally getting to like the finish line of the revisions for the the text um I think one of the things that was difficult is I was so focused on the illustrations and can I do the illustrations and you know, what will they be like? And it just was hampering the writing process. But now we're right. in the finish line and it's been incredibly rewarding to just to kind of like flex your creative muscles and yeah. kind of see what you're made of, right? You know, totally. totally. the more we challenge ourselves, the better we become in all yeah. areas. Yeah. I mean, it's so. funny because whenever I do something like that, I, I, when I, whenever I take on a new genre or, you know, like a new age group, cause I'm also writing YA, yeah. it, it, it is always like, why did I do this to myself? You know, like just when I've nailed something, why did I have to add this whole other level of like difficultiness and impossibility to, you know, my whatever creative muscle. And, but you're right. Like after you've, you've unlocked it, it's so rewarding. Yes, you know, and actually YA is the one area where I've, I've definitely written YA, like, you know, but nothing that's, that's necessarily ready for the world. So it's interesting that for me, it, it, YA is also hard, but for different reasons. I think because my teenage year, my middle school years, my adolescence in general was, was not necessarily the most joyful time. <laughs> But uh, my teenage years were were particularly really difficult for many reasons. So I think it's hard for me to to um, fall into that mindset, you know. Right. And I'm, right. I'm curious for you if it was difficult for you writing. It was. It, it like really was. It was so difficult because. Um, I'm someone who, you know, did not have a normal, like, high school experience. I actually skipped high school, believe it or not. I went to college at a really early age. And so, it, you know, I didn't have the normal trajectory that everybody else had. So I couldn't reference all the normal things. Um, so it was actually really great that I wrote Parachutes because those kids were new coming from from Asia, they were new coming to the States. And so everything was new to them. And I was kind of like discovering it along with them. I was like Googling like high school <laughs> schedules and like, <laughs> and like, what is, you know, what is the pool of a high school? Like, is it going to be locked on the weekends or not locked? I mean, just like random, random little things. Um, but yeah, it was, it was actually a project originally that I started when I was just waiting because I hate waiting in between edits, you know? And we spend so much, that's the thing people don't realize is like we, you know, for those of us in this as a career, like we spend a lot of time waiting. Yes. And, you know, it got to a point where I was like, this is, this is like torture to just, <laughs> and it's, I'm not saying like my editors took forever or anything. They took like the normal amount of time that you, you should take, but just like waiting weeks and weeks on end, you get a little stir crazy if you're not yes. working on something else. So I originally worked on that project as just a project for myself. It wasn't necessarily for the public. It was just something that I wanted to try out. And I guess my question to you is, you know, now that we're, you know, we're in this period where like, we're trying to create things for consumption. Uh, is there any, do you still feel like there, you know, we can still protect that part of creativity for ourselves? Like, how do you, you know, how do you 
deal with that as a creator? That is such a great question because I think about that a lot. And I think, I think that's where the, your, the people you're surrounded with come in. And what I mean is the professional people you're surrounded with. And I've been very fortunate uh, to have an editor. I've been with the same editor since book one. I have an agent who's wonderful. And I think honestly, um, for me, because, you know, my editor has always told me, um, just write the, keep writing good books and that's all you need to worry about. And, and someone telling you that really, it's almost like you need permission from other people to uh, do the things that you want to do or create the things you want to create. So there's not pressure, at least, you know, maybe we put pressure on ourselves sometimes with like, oh, did I sell this many books or right. am I on New York Times books bestseller list or whatever. And definitely those things get in our brains because how could they not? Right. Also, because there's always someone out there who is outperforming you at every turn. I mean, that's right. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. So I think whenever those thoughts come in, whenever I start finding myself being distracted by the consumption part of it, I always just try to go back to, to be honest, back to my editor's words, just, mm -hmm. just keep writing good books. And the good books that we write are the ones that come from, you know, a very honest place. So right, I, right, I try to right. keep it in perspective by saying, you know, there was a time years ago where I would have been happy to publish a book and have 10 people read it who loved it and no one else. And that would have made me so happy. And I think as we get more successful and as we yes. spend more time in the business, our yeah. barometer changes of what success means. Yeah. So we have to kind of like go back and check ourselves, right? Absolutely. Say, Wait a minute. You know, like <laughs> 10 years ago, this would have been a dream come true. Like, right. And try to keep it back in that honest place to where we're not yes. just churning things out for, like you said, for consumption, because it yeah. does change things. It definitely changes Absolutely. things. Absolutely. It does. Um, and I'm yeah. finding myself like I've had to push books back. I pushed um, the sequel to Front Desk back. It was originally supposed to be published in 2019 fall. And I just it wasn't ready. It wasn't it wasn't that good. Honestly, you know, it wasn't as good as the first book. And I needed that time to make it the best book that it can be, which I'm really proud of. It actually is a really great book now. And I'm really, really proud of it. Um, but I needed to push back and sometimes just say like, I am not, you know, I'm not a machine. Like I can't <laughs> just turn it around. I try to work as, 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 you know, hard as I can, as fast as I can, but good things really take that time to make it really special. And we need, um, you know, we need time to hold our newborns sometimes, you know, like yes. sometimes, I really like want to sit on things for a little while before handing it off because yes. I feel like the minute we give it to even our agents, like it is sort of becomes, you know, everybody's baby rather than like your baby. Do you Absolutely. feel that way? Definitely. And I feel like each process that I go through when, when writing a book, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in my head before I ever put anything on paper, just mm -hmm. letting it grow and percolate. And then, once I put it on paper, it becomes something different. And right. once I, because I do everything longhand, you know, and then once I put it in the computer, it becomes something else. Once I send it to my agent, it becomes something else. Yeah. So each step, it kind of becomes a shared, you know, writing is solitary, but publishing is a team effort. So yeah. um, at each step, it becomes something different. So I, I try to be really protective of those steps. And like you said, I don't want to write something, you know, just just to write it you know and I, right. think, I think the good thing is when you have uh, a publishing team that supports you and isn't pushing you to do those things I think it makes a difference mm -hmm. if you have an agent who's supporting you and isn't you know pushing you to do those things and also you know I don't write uh, books in a series and I write uh, middle grade with kind of what I what I perceive as evergreen topics that have a long <laughs> shelf life right so it's not like someone's waiting for the next you know, Harry Potter to come out or whatever it is. I think right? the world, I think the world is always waiting for the next Aaron and Charlie oh, Kelly book. I think so. On. Absolutely. <laughs> but okay. So we talk about, you know, you, you write standalone books that are so magical, each and every one of them. And some of them are just like, just, just so lyrical and beautiful. How, how hard is it to say goodbye to your characters? Like, do you ever feel like there should be a Hello Universe too. <laughs> it's uh, actually no, because once I finish, honestly, once 
I'm done with, um, once it gets to that, the copy editing stage, you know, the final stages, mm -hmm. I have already mentally moved on to the next project. Right. So it's, it's not often, you know, that the book is behind me. So right. the only time I ever felt that way is with uh, You Go First, which was my fourth book. And there's a character in that book named uh, Ben. And he's one of my favorite characters I've ever written. So he's the only character that I've gone back to revisit. And I mean okay. that, like, I actually picked up a book and read his sections again, which is, oh. kind of, it's so strange because I wrote him, but I feel like I want to spend time with him again, just because I, yeah. I love him so much. Oh, so, so sweet. Yeah, but it's not like enough to build a sequel on. It's just that yeah. I loved spending time with him when I was writing the book and I kind of missed him. And that's the only time that's ever happened. Well, but, I think you bring such a good point because we write so much for everybody else that we forget to almost enjoy our own words. You know, I mean, how, like, I don't usually pick up front desk and reread it, you know? No, there, are right, passages, yeah. there are passages I know from reading them out loud so many times for different classes or online things. There are passages I know almost by heart. There are definitely lines I know by heart. Um, but to find that joy, I mean, that's, I think that's something that a lot of authors in my position are struggling with. So we look to you for advice is how do we keep that joy? Because it is a career and we're building towards, you know, many, 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 many books and many, many, many years of writing. Um, how do we keep that joy in our work? Um, and is that something that you've always been able to find growing up? Like, were you always a writer from when you were a kid? Yes. So ever since I was a little kid, I was a writer. And because, um, to be quite honest, because I was such a, you know, I suffered from uh, depression. I was not a joyful child in, by any stretch of the imagination. And often I spent a lot of time wishing I was someplace else. You know, I, I want to be anywhere but here kind of thing. Right. And so one of the things that I would do to self-comfort is I would dream about one day I'm going to be a writer and none of this will matter. And I'm yeah. going to write books and it's going to be amazing. And that was like, it was really like a security blanket. And yeah. what was so bizarre is after I published my first book, you know, and that security blanket kept me warm even into adulthood. Right. Right. So whenever right. I, my first book came out, it was so sh surreal to me because I reached for the blanket, but it had happened. And so it was almost like, now what do I now what do I cover up with? Because yeah, the dream exactly. happened, right? Yeah, like this so, thing. Like, yeah, it, I totally, I totally, totally, a hundred percent can understand and relate to what you're saying. Because for so many of us, this was our thing. This was our secret passion. This was the thing that was for us. Um, and I'm not saying like we're not grateful. Like we're so happy we get to do this. I'm so happy. But yeah. it's really interesting when the thing that you love to do the most also because it becomes the thing that you're judged on. You know? Yes. That's and that true. And that's that's like, I, I was not expecting that. Like, I had no idea going in, there was going to be this much, you know, pressure. And I feel like there's, there's got to be tons of pressure on you. Like, did you feel like after winning the Newbery, was there more pressure for you? I feel like, you know what, honestly, no. And, and I think it all goes back to, you know, I had such a great publishing team that was around me. And, and um, if there was pressure, it, it would have only been pressure I put on myself, which I would have done anyway. <laughs> so you know I'm, I'm kind of a high achiever you know so right. the pressure would have been there regardless yeah um and it was it, to be honest it was such you know that first year was such a whirlwind of craziness um uh, what was the call like what was the call like because I've gotten a lot of questions Stacy McAnulty who I think is watching this wanted me to ask you what was the call <laughs> <laughs> um, so honestly, they had an old phone number of mine. So I always joked that they had because I, you know, I moved to Pennsylvania to the Northeast from Louisiana, and they had my old Louisiana number. So if someone in I always joke that someone in Louisiana thinks they won the Newberry now. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so they called and um, they did not have the right number. So you know, I knew that the call comes in early in the morning, right? And number one, no one is ever really expecting that call. I mean, I right. certainly was not right. thinking, oh, are they, they're going to call me at 3 a.m. <laughs> um, I just drove to work and I was actually thinking about it. I thought, oh, when I get to work, I'm going to Google and I want to see who, you know, who won. And I was just right. really wondering about it. And then the phone rang in my car 
And at the time, I mean, I write full time now, but at the time I was working as a, a copy editor, a corporate in the corporate world. And I was in traffic on 95 and the call came in and I was so confused. And basically <laughs> like there's a YouTube video of the call. And what? Oh yes, they, they post their, their calls to everyone. I think every year it's a tradition. Oh, wow. So there's like a big silence, dead silence where I'm like, what? You know, and they had to repeat it. And I you know, called out from work and then turned around and drove back home and watched the live feed. And honestly, oh my that, whenever my book came on the, the computer on the laptop. Yeah. I'm I'm not one who, who typically sheds tears of joy, you know, like, oh, I'm so happy and overwhelmed. I'm going to cry now with joy. Yeah. Even whenever I got my agent, when I got my book deal, when I got the initial phone call, but whenever they announced it on that press conference, it was the first time I cried. Wow. From joy. And I just oh my God. cried and cried. It was, it was really incredible. <sighs> That's yeah. so wonderful. And I read your speech that you made. I loved it so much. I wish Thank I had been you. there in the audience. But this was before, I think this was before I debuted. Um, but it was, you know, it was just so wonderful seeing an Asian American novelist, you know, getting this thing. And really, I mean, this is just, you're such an inspiration to all of us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so of all of your books, which one is your favorite? Is that, is that a, is that a, not an okay question to ask because I get it's, asked this, you know, sometimes it's like, I, what's your I, favorite character? <laughs> well, whenever I, whenever I do school visits and, and talk, I always say you can ask me anything you want. So mm -hmm. there are no bad questions. Um, so it's tricky because, you know, like a lot of authors, you included, I'm sure you love different books for different reasons, but probably my favorite is the land of forgotten girls, which is my second book. And it is my least read, but it's still my, my favorite. Um, Why is it your favorite? It's my favorite because it's all about um, these two sisters growing up in very, very dire circumstances. And they use their imagination as a means of escape. Mm. And that's something that really resonates with me, you know, when they have these very bleak surroundings, but they, they imagine themselves someplace else, right? Which right. is exactly what I was talking about. So it, it just has a very special place. That book just has a very special place in my heart. Right, right. And you know, I did a lot of that as a kid, just imagining that I was somewhere else because I hated being in the motel. I mean, I loved being in the motel in certain ways. I like loved, I actually loved the day to day and all the, all the different, you know, going to do the vending machine and then going to check out the pool and all that stuff. But I hated the fact that I was so different from everyone else. I felt like there was something wrong with me that I was, you know, living in worse circumstances than everyone else that I ought to be ashamed of that. So I would always write about living in a house and living, you know, living in a proper house with like a proper yard and like a staircase. I was like obsessed with the staircase. It had to be like a two story house. And now that I'm actually living in a house, guess what I'm writing about? Living in a motel. <laughs> It's funny how life works out that way. I know, right? And when did you, when, I mean, was that hard for you as well? Like, did, were there, because I remember starting to write novels and, you know, even like in my 20s, you know, in my late teens, 20s, trying to write. And it was always like, I was trying to write like the pretty white girl, you know, and I was, <laughs> I was always writing these fake things. And when, when did it become like, okay, I don't even remember for me when that happened. But when something happens, when you feel like, you know what, actually, I'm going to go and write about myself or m people like me, and that's okay. Honestly, um, so when I was growing up, all my characters were like blonde, blue eyed, you know, so yeah, you know. Really? Um, yeah. there were definitely no immigrant parents in the mix or any weird food being cooked at home, weird food. <laughs> <laughs> like at my house. Um, but honestly, whenever I was like in my early twenties, I decided, you know, I kept trying to write the, you know, the next great American novel, whatever that right. is. And it just kept fizzling out, you know, I was writing for adults yeah, and I just couldn't finish any of the books. And I started writing short stories because my mother, you know, for years growing up, my mother told me stories about growing up in the Philippines and she was mm -hmm. very, very poor. And I didn't want to hear anything about it, of course. Uh, but then whenever I got older and I started 
really listening to her stories, I thought, okay, well, these stories are actually really interesting, right? Yeah. So I would use them as inspiration to write short stories. So I started writing short stories and with Filipino characters and the short stories started getting picked up. And um, I noticed a couple things as like I was publishing more and more short stories. And one of the things I noticed was that people were very interested in the Filipino culture, you know, mm -hmm. but at this point I'm not writing for kids. I'm writing for, you know, literary magazines or what have you. But the other thing I noticed uh, also important is that all my short stories had characters between the ages of eight and 12. And they're almost all coming of age stories. So I thought that's interesting. There's something about that age that's really yeah. speaking to me. Yeah. So I thought maybe I should be writing for that age group and about that age group. Right. And that's how it started. So I think, you know, I think with a lot of authors, their first books tend to be the closest to their own experience, you know, right. so I started writing Blackbird Fly and, and she was, you know, a Filipino girl. And, you know, I mean, I was born and raised in the States, but in the book, Apple immigrates to the US from the Philippines. And I was writing from my own experience, you know, with some differences, right. of course. Right. And I wasn't sure if people would be interested uh, in that aspect of it, but I discovered that a lot of people were intrigued because there aren't a lot of, um, at least at the time, which wasn't really, was, wasn't even that long ago, um, there weren't a lot of, of stories from that point of view and also from, because uh, she, she lives in Louisiana, Right. A lot of the immigrant stories were coming from, you know, the coasts and yeah. where there's large immigrant population. And interestingly enough, when we first moved here, we moved to Louisiana. Oh, really? Where? In Monroe, Louisiana. Oh, OK. North Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> so like I have world. so many great memories of Louisiana because everybody was very, very warm and welcoming and accepting. You know, I didn't speak a word of English, so I was I was actually um, like in serious trouble trying to find the bathroom all the time <laughs> wow. you know? um, but I really loved it and everybody was just really really kind you know a small town work very working class but um everybody just kind of yeah I, I mean oh, I, so I, great. I loved it yeah it was really I didn't great know that yeah. Um, so I you know that the, like you know everything you're saying like all the different types of immigrant experiences or people of color ex experiences and it's not just you know moving to California or moving to New York or whatever it's like all these different things and seeing it portrayed so beautifully on the page and soon on the screen can you tell us a little bit about that yeah so um it's very early stages I think they're finalizing the script oh, right awesome. now so we haven't gotten to like casting stuff or anything yet I keep waiting for them to be like never mind we changed our minds <laughs> but no so far, that has not happened uh, I think it's it's so exciting I mean my kids watch Netflix and every day they're like you know we need more diverse we need more diverse stories mom there's like it's all just Barbie stuff um I mean I think that they are making a big effort I think they're making a big effort to change it up. And I, I think I can't wait for really great stories like your book Definitely. to be adapted. And honestly, from, from the meetings that I've had um, with everyone at Netflix, um, that definitely seems to be a very, very clear focus. In fact, the whole, everyone I've met with have been people of color. The screenwriter is a Filipino American. So the producer is, you know, Asian American and then Forrest Whitaker, of course. So um, it, it's really great. I know that it's something that they, they take very seriously. Um, and it's from a very genuine place because all of them also want to see representation that they didn't get when Absolutely. they were growing up. Absolutely. So. And I mean, I love Netflix. I'm a huge Netflix person. Um, but is it, is how, I mean, how do you feel about it being adapted? Like, was, was there ever a moment, you know, because a lot of authors are very worried about their books getting adapted and, you know, it's out of our control, right? Like once we sign that piece of paper, <laughs> it's out of our control and they could change it up and they can make things totally wacky. Um, was that something that you had to, you know, struggle with? You know what? They asked me initially on the initial phone call, what is one thing that is very sacred to you with with the book and one thing you would be very upset about and i said um 
the representation, right? Mm -hmm. So, so Virgil is Filipino American and Kaori is Japanese American. And, you know, uh, there's all these different representations. So right. I told them that was the most important thing to me. And they said, of course, you know, that that's not, that is sacred to us as well. Right. Um, but other than that, honestly, I don't know if this makes me um, strange or whatever, but I'm really not that, I, I don't feel very protective of it as far as what they're going to do with it, because I feel like from the meetings I've had, I, I trust them with it, but also I'm, I'm viewing it, the adaptation as a completely separate, you know, I have the source material and what, whatever they create is a separate thing. Right. You know, it's like a cousin. cousin. Yeah. Yes. So it's like I a close cousin. Expect, <laughs> yes. Right. So I don't expect it to be exactly the same as the book because, right. you know, why would it it's be? never going to be it's never no. going to be I mean they don't just don't have enough space right it's never going to be 100% exactly but if hopefully they'll capture the essence of what makes the book so special and yeah. if they can capture that I think it'll be just oh, such and you a know what I think is important too is that what, what the essence that they feel could be different from the essence that someone else feels or that I felt writing it you know it's their interpretation of the book Right. Um, so I, I, I'm involved in a tangential sense where I get updates, but you know, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't feel nervous or like, Oh, protect. You're very myself. Zen about it. I love it. I, I try to be very <laughs> Zen about it. I'm just That's like, amazing. first of all, I hope, hope, you know, that they don't change, you know, they don't change their minds and give me that phone call. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but second of all, I'm mostly just really excited to see where it goes, but also because it involves a lot of waiting. Like, you know, you thought publishing was slow. I mean, this, this industry is I think, yeah. even slower. Yeah. So I'm always working on other stuff so that I'm right. not, you know, I mean, that, that's the key, right? Is to keep yourself busy with projects. Right. So you're not obsessing over the things that you're waiting on. Yeah. Cause it can be very, you know, anxiety inducing. Like, I mean, our industry, so much of it is like I said, waiting around. We're just waiting, waiting, waiting. Yes, definitely. Um, what is the most exciting thing that's happening? What would you say it's the Newberry or would you say it, it's something else? I'm gonna have to go with the Newberry. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's kind of hard to top that, you know, yeah. in, in the, in what we do. So yeah, it's really hard to top that. And also, um, you know, being on the New York Times list, of course, right? right, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That was so unexpected for me because the book had been out for like a year already. And I mean, I hadn't I didn't win anything. I mean, won, I won the Asian American um, Award for Literature, which was wonderful. But that happened like in what was it like June or something? Yeah. And so this was this was like just randomly in September, I think. And the book, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, my dog. <laughs> the book stop it the book I hope that's been, your dog. yeah he's uh he's yeah let him out he's uh he's just he, he's a sweet dog but he loves to bark when he hears the, the door <laughs> anyway so I, I had no idea that it was going to be on and this was the first um paperback list that they had in a while so it must have been it must have been the paperback but yeah i remember walking i was in New York visiting my publishers. So I got to celebrate with them. But I oh, had just amazing. Left, I know. And I just I just left the scholastic offices when it happened. And so I didn't get to celebrate with the whole team. Um, but I did get to have breakfast with um, the publisher and I, I got to celebrate with my agent. Oh, it was that's cool. really cool. It was really, really cool. What about because for you? You know what? With the New York Times list, it's like um, you know, People know what the Newberry is, obviously, but a lot of people don't know what it is. So, but everyone knows what the New York Times bestseller list is. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, and so with the Newberry, do you have it in a special place in your house? I have it in my library upstairs. So okay. it's in, you know, they give you a little nice, you know, thing to keep your metal in. So <laughs> it's just sitting there on my on my table yeah oh that's so great okay so we're gonna wrap up soon because i know you have to go but i would want i want you to give three tips for teenagers who are starting out writing and three tips for people who are you know trying to become authors okay so my tips would be um first of all read well and often so to be a good writer you have to be a good reader which means um 
reading books. Yeah. Um, and then two, it would be to write often. I mean, it feels like a very obvious thing, but it takes a lot of, as we all know, it takes a lot of practice and just like right. any craft. You do know, you I write think, every day? Is this something that you... I do not write every day, but I write every day in my head, which I count as writing. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I, I've been saying this all along. You know, like, we need to count everything as writing, right? We need to count taking notes, outlining. I don't know. Do you outline? Are you an outliner? I do. Yes. Yes. Okay. All so, like, counts. all that, right? All sometimes that Sometimes even as reading can count because yeah. sometimes we get inspired by what we're reading. So, yeah. I think, so I'm glad you said that. So, when I say write often, that means it could even mean writing in your head. It could mean um, actual writing, um, but you have to work at it. I think, I think we think of you know, writing as art a lot, which it is, of course, but it's also a craft. Right. So you do have to practice it. It's not just divine intervention, you know, when you, <laughs> you craft some beautiful work of art and then go on yeah. with your day. Like, yeah, you and you know, we don't, like, we, you know, those of us who have to do this for a living, we can't, we don't always have the luxury of waiting until we're really inspired or we're in the sure. perfect writing conditions, right? Right now, there is no perfect writing condition. I spend most of my time writing in the closet and I can barely breathe in there. Like, I really think I'm going to, like, suffocate one of these days. <laughs> We're going to find you with a notebook and like a pen and, and on your lap. I was, I was thinking this the other day. I was like, man, like my head hurts. Like, I feel like I could write better if I had more air or something. <laughs> yes, um, air is good. That, that's a good tip yeah. as well. Breathe. Yeah. Um, so I think another thing is, you know, a lot of young writers, especially, they tell me that. Uh, what do you do when you're working on something and then you get another idea and you want to work on that instead and then you get another idea and yeah, you can't finish it. That happens anything. to me a lot. Yes. <laughs> and what, what I tell them is go where your creative spirit is taking you. So there's no rule that says you must finish what you're working on. If you're compelled to work on something else, work on that. And right. eventually you'll find something that really speaks to you that you stay with. So, you know, if you want to write something else, then go write that other thing. So that was right. my what and, about for debut authors or people who are just starting out? What are your biggest tips, things that you wish you'd known? Things that I wish I'd known. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things that will always serve you well as a writer or, and in life for that matter is to support other people. So um, instead of spending a lot of time just kind of mired in your own work and worrying about the success or lack of success of your work, supporting and uplifting other writers. And you're um, big on that. I see you on, I see you on Twitter, on Instagram, and you're always lifting everybody else up. And it's so wonderful. Oh, and so, thank you. It's one of the things I love about our community. You know, like we are, even though we're, we, we, we don't really compete with each other because every book is so different. Um, but where there really is this feeling of camaraderie that we're in it together you know, that we're here for each other. And like, especially yes. women of color, like we really have to lift each other. <laughs> yes, so. absolutely. And I feel like it feeds my, I mean, it's, it's just a good thing to do as a human being to support mm -hmm. other people's work and uplift them. But also it just, it takes you out of your own head and, mm -hmm. and you're doing something productive that's outside of yourself. Right. Um, but in order to do that as well, you need to be reading the works of other writers, you know, and, and expanding your, your bookshelf, decolonizing your bookshelf, diversifying your bookshelf, um, which is also really important. So um, for debut authors, I think, I think one thing that I would say is that um, you have permission to feel however you feel. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's true in life as well, right? But there were times after my debut when I was very down and depressed and blue and I couldn't quite figure it out. And then I was hard on myself because I felt like, oh, why are you being so ungrateful? This great thing has happened. Right. It's a lot of emotions that, that come along with achieving a lifelong goal or a long time goal you've had. So whatever you're yeah. feeling, totally fine, I would say. And I'm yeah.